Hi, it's Dennis Daly. When Julia Child and her husband came back to New England after years overseas, him working with the State Department, they discovered a couple of things, one of which was television. And the very new PBS station in Boston was crying for somebody to help out on the air. Julia Child had studied cooking in Europe. She said, I'll do a cooking show. Let's have a guest. I'll talk to them. In about a month, the guests stopped coming, and Julia Child started cooking on her own. And the rest is history. Wouldn't you like to have Julia Child around the house here at Christmas time? One of the first things I wanted to know was, how is Christmas cooking different now than it was years ago? Well, I think you have to think of the cooking facilities that they used to have, the old coal stove, and, and it was usually cold and anyway and you probably had your meal at about four in the afternoon and you started your turkey early in the morning and all of that and, and now i think things are so much easier that, that it doesn't isn't it must have been quite difficult then but then in those days too a lot of families had help which nobody has now unless you have family friends and relatives Let's move up a couple of centuries. I remember asking my grandmother many years ago how food, for example, in the earlier part of this century was different. And she said, at least in the Midwest, where everything today seems to be pork, hamburger, and chicken, there was a greater variety of other types of meat at, uh, say, even between the First and Second World War. Mm -hmm. Well, my, gran my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, came from a small town in Illinois, and she was a wonderful cook. And they used to send for oysters from Boston, which came out packed in big barrels of cornmeal. And they'd keep them down in their cellar, and they lasted for several weeks. But they ate awfully well, because it was in farming country. So, of course, they had pumpkins and all kinds of things like that. Not, of course, not the fresh salads, because they didn't come in until around the 30s, I think. <laughs> well, some people aren't interested in eating at all, strangely enough. But we we found we have a very wide spectrum and a great many men, all, all kinds, like the gas man who came today and so forth. Traditionally, the image of the chef has been the male chef, at least in, in many people's minds. Is that changing, or has that been a misconception over the years? Well, I think it's beginning to change now, just as woman's role is beginning to change. That I mean, today we had our Xerox machine fixed, and it wasn't the repair man, it was a young woman who came in, which interested me very much. She did an extremely good job. But this is only really recently that, that women have been taking on these various things, particularly the older generation French, you know, like Jacques Pépin, who was a middle-aged and that, of that group. He still, although he teaches women, he doesn't think women's places in the restaurant kitchen. But the younger French chefs are beginning to accept them, and certainly a great many of the American ones are. Do you ever harbor the fear that with the age of microwave cooking and instant everything, that it will not be too many generations before in most families the art of cooking will be lost? Well, I think it depends on whether or not people enjoy eating. It's like we've always had frozen foods, and if people have not really eaten much, they're perfectly happy with the frozen green bean, which I think is about the most miserable and tasteless thing in the world, or so these frozen dinners. And if people have done their own cooking and eaten fresh food, they, can't, they, they never eat that kind of stuff. So I think it just depends on how you're brought up and how much you are interested in, in food is fun. Dining well is fun, and it can be very, very simple indeed. But it's one of the nicest ways to, to entertain one's friends, and it can be very simple indeed. It can, of course, even be a, a pizza that you send out for. Or, but the main thing is sitting around and breaking bread together and drinking a glass of wine and just having a good informal time. Food is very therapeutic. It's comforting, and it's fun, and it's friendly, and I always feel that the family that eats together stays together. 
I'm afraid quite often anymore, though, uh, people just cross paths they don't have supper. Or they just go out and graze, but that's certainly, when you think of, of the great feast, how, how marvelous everyone gathered around the groaning board with the big turkey or the goose or whatever it is. It's just terribly exciting, and it smells good, and it's fun and warm, and this one is not living in a happy family, of course. What do you feel about all of this uh, sudden rise in salad bars almost in every 7-Eleven you go in now? Well, I, don't, I would never touch one myself because you don't know how long it sat out there or what kind of preservatives they put on them and how many people have sneezed into them. I wouldn't touch one at all, would you? That does bring up a whole other area as far as food safety. Is it an oversimplification to say that with the amount of food consumed and the variety of processing, we're really lucky in this country that the food supply is as healthy as it is? I think so, and I think, I think it's very useful to have all this discussion of salmonella and chicken because as soon as there's discussion of it, then people do something about it. It was like Rachel Carson. I think just the fact that she alerted people to the poisons and the residual dangers of, of poisons and insecticides, that has helped us. Well, like Uncle Tom's Cabin helped. And I think you have to have a great to-do before anything is done. Let's talk about nutrition for a minute. It seems like every place we turn, there is something about what we should and shouldn't be eating. How does that strike you? <laughs> um, well, I think that... Anyone who reads the papers and listens to the television and has any intelligence whatsoever is very well aware of nutrition nowadays, of not overdoing on, on fats and calories and things like that, of watching the weight and trying to eat a well-balanced diet. And I would think that, that, that the average middle American should be much more well aware of good nutrition than any, any place else in the world. Unless they're really living in a vacuum, because you're besieged by information almost every moment. In fact, I think we're so much besieged that you know, very often we get the wrong information, because as soon as they say, don't eat too much salt, then all the television ads for cereals say, no sodium, then you find people that aren't eating any salt at all and become ill. So I think we have to be careful about getting the correct information, but I think people are very well aware of nutrition now. And that old woman you see getting off the train and her bones are all gone. But actually, I don't think eating calcium when you're older does you any good at all, is it? I think it's only during the formative years that you have to do it. I, I don't think you can make up for lost time, you're right. You no. Know, the thing is, get the good nutrition as you're growing up, which is the terrible problem, I think, in the third world where you have people starving and they're unable to feed themselves or their children properly so that you have their brains don't develop, their bodies don't develop, and so they will be in a perpetual state of malnutrition. There was a story the other day about the fact that people were sending powdered milk and the like to the third world, forgetting that sometimes there's not even enough plain water to make it with. No, exactly. Just out of curiosity, where does Julia Child go when she's hungry? Uh, for some reason in the back of my mind, if I were to ever go to Boston, I can't picture you sitting uh, at a McDonald's. Well, I'm, I'm, if I have to, I'd much rather go to McDonald's and eat on an airline because you know exactly what you're getting and it's clean and well inspected. Well, would we eat lots of fruits and vegetables, we eat fresh food all the time. You're always going to get people that don't really care what they eat. They just feed themselves and the other people who really enjoy it. And we hope that that other, that group of gastronomes are going to grow. And the main thing is it doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to be fresh and decently cooked. When you do the programs you have uh, and that have brought us so much joy on television and the, and the cookbooks that you've put together, it, it always delights me to see the spontaneity of that sometimes little things will go wrong, but it, it doesn't fluster you. It, I think it makes the viewer feel more like that uh, if Julia Child can spill a little bit here or make a mistake there, then, then I have a chance at doing the recipe myself. You have to be able to recover. No matter what happens, you have to be, you have to be able to recover and never apologize if you're served to people. Have you ever had a real disaster cooking that you'd care to share with us? <laughs> well, same that you're... Now that everyone has a food processor, everyone can make a fish mousse. And supposing you were making a fish mousse and you had, had it in, in the oven and it was baking and everything, and then you wanted to unmold it, and it just wasn't, wouldn't unmold or it wasn't quite the right fish, so it all collapsed. You're going to have to do something with it. You can turn it into a very good soup. Just using your imagination and, as they say, making uh, lemonade out of a lemon. You can't do much about a fallen souffle, and it's very hard to do anything about burned food. But you can usually 
do something with almost anything. I always thought it would be a delight to work on the television crew for your program and get the leftovers. Well, we all eat them, so they're all well cooked with the right ingredients, and then we eat them when the show is done ourselves, or we eat it for lunch the next day. Is it not true that traditionally over the years, cookbooks have been the best-selling books on the newsstands? Well, I think that they have a good a good cookbook with the right publicity, and then sometimes they, they sell wonderfully, say, for two years, and then that's the end of it. Like, there was Michel Gerard and his cuisine masseur, Lean Cuisine. But there are a few always best-sellers, like the Joy of Good Basic books, like The Joy of Cooking and the... Fanny Farmer and so forth. Not to put words in your mouth, but with all the emphasis on diets now, do you feel that maybe some people think that they just have to eat nothing in order to lose weight and forget that really the good foods aren't fattening as long as you don't eat too much of them? It's mostly because they're, they're ill-informed. I was just talking to a doctor who was at the Harvard Medical School last night, and we were discussing a people's actual fear of food because they really don't know enough about it. And that one really should have some kind of guidelines so that it's quite all right to eat a big piece of chocolate cake, but you know what you're doing, so you cut down on all the rest of your fatty things during the day, or maybe for two days, but that you can enjoy something, and you shouldn't have a guilt feeling about it. But I think if people are afraid of their food, they're not going to digest it well, and that's very bad for them. And I think it's a matter of knowing more about it, and I think that as the whole country is becoming more sophisticated about eating and more people are drinking wine, I think that gradually it will seep into those hinterlands that it's quite all right, taken in moderation. In fact, it's very beneficial because it relaxes people and makes them happy. Let's take just a minute, if we can, to, to look at some other sides of Julia Child. I don't want to give you the impression that I think you're just a two-dimensional character who only knows about food. Uh, unfortunately, those of us who only see you on TV or maybe have written or, or seen your books think of you only in terms of food, but I would take it that a, a, a wonderfully friendly, well-educated woman such as yourself, that there are other aspects of your life that uh, maybe are just as fulfilling or that we don't know about. Well, I'm a cook and a writer, and I just adore my my work, we have friends whom we love, and we love traveling, and we like music and museums, but we really love and are passionate about our work, and I think we're very lucky that we are. I have just written a book called, with my colleagues called Mastering the Art of French Cooking, and at that point, the Kennedys were in the White House, and they had a wonderful French chef, René Verdun, and people were just beginning to Aeroplane travel was just available, and people were going over to abroad and so forth, and French cooking was very much in. So this started out as a show on French cooking, and for a television show, you have to have something very short, so that, let I me mean, just say three words, so it will get on one line in the listing. And we thought of all kinds of things, but the French chef seemed to work out beautifully, and at that point, I had hoped that we would have visiting chefs, which, of course, we never did. Well, that, that's how that, that came about, because I'm neither French nor a chef. I'm a, an American home cook. Did you think 25 years ago that the program would meet with as much continuing success as it has? I was amazed, because we'd hardly even seen any television before. As we'd been living abroad, my husband was in the diplomatic service, and we'd been abroad for 20 years. Then we got this book written and came back, and... We had hardly seen television when we suddenly were on it. So you became a very important part of a, a medium that you hadn't had much experience with. I had none at all. I've done, I done a lot of teaching and demonstrations. I think that makes a difference. And I'm a natural ham, which makes quite a bit of difference, too. Well, I don't think I've ever watched one of your programs that I did not feel that you were talking directly to me. You have a great knack for communication. Well, that's the nice thing about just being one person on it so that I'm talking to the camera, which is you. But if you have two people on, then the two people are talking to each other. So it's really better just having one, I think. Let me close out by just asking your impressions of a, of a couple of things, if I can. I, I know that everyone that has a career does not always have the opportunity to see his or her work when you travel. But you mentioned early on here that nearly everyone eats. Food is of interest to everyone. It must be a grand feeling to be able to work with something that is as basic 
to our existence as 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 warm a part of our psyche, if you will, as is food. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it is. And what I think is wonderful now is that we have more and more well-educated people who are going into the business. So many of the fine American chefs are all university trained, and, th and then they decided they like food, so they went into it. And this is not true abroad. Abroad, chefs are usually blue collar and are really and are not educated. And in this case, it's, it's quite different. And I think that's one reason we have developed in this country. You know, we have the American Institute of Wine and Food, which was established about five years ago with a library and conferences on gastronomy, an attempt to make gastronomy or food and wine an accepted profession, as is, you know, architecture and medicine and so forth, because certainly gastronomy is one of the fine arts. One final thing, Christmas time, a big Christmas dinner, what do you see as the ingredients, the serving, if you would, for the classic American Christmas dinner? Heavens, it well, would either be turkey or goose. We always have turkey for Thanksgiving and goose for Christmas. And certainly on the East Coast, we would have oysters to begin with, either an oyster stew or oysters on the half shell. And certainly a homemade plum pudding. Of course, you can buy them, but they're wonderful to make yourself. And hard sauce. I think that sounds pretty good. I guess Brussels, you have to have Brussels sprouts, I think. And oh, it sounds delightful. I, I wish we all had someone like you in our household to uh, to warm our Christmas with that kind of cuisine. Uh, well, it's just... It's a wonderful meal, I think, and a great deal of fun for everybody. Celebrations like Thanksgiving and Christmas are wonderful. And I must tell you a quick story. I interviewed Julia Child on the phone. I had a new roommate at the time who did not know what I did for a living. The next day, Julia Child called. My roommate answered. The day after that, she called me at the office and said, Who is your roommate? Whoever he is, he thought I was someone imitating Julia Child. Some thoughts out of the archives from Julia Child. I'm Dennis Daly.